Well, good morning and welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see everyone today again, old faces and new faces. Um, and um, I wanted to take the time to uh, thank each and every person who makes the effort to come here and attend at least one of these lectures or some of them. Um, I really do feel your energy and your enthusiasm and your passion for, uh, for learning. And I really believe that this has fueled these lectures. And um, I really look forward to coming here each week and moving along this journey together as we discover Al Andalus. So thank you very much. And um, we have been moving across time and space at a rapid speed. Uh, and I hope you've been enjoying uh, this journey as much as I have. Um, and your questions have been great, so please continue to ask them. Um, I try to incorporate them in, in, uh, in the material uh, that I use in each lecture um, uh, in the following week. Last week, we began our discussion about a tale of two cities, and we started with Cordoba. Uh, and today, we will begin by continuing to talk about Cordoba uh, and also pay particular attention to the palatial city built by the Umayyads to the west of Cordoba, known as Madinat al Zahra, uh, which means the shining city. Last week, we learned that Cordoba had been a prominent Roman city in antiquity and was able to develop and become prosperous because of its location on the, back, the banks of the Guadalquivir River, which enabled it suitable for commercial trade and mercantile activities. Although the Visigothic capital of the Iberian Peninsula had been Toledo, the Muslim conquerors chose Cordoba as the seat of their new government from the moment they established themselves uh, there in 716, which was shortly after their arrival and invasion in Spain in 711. The city developed under the early Muslim governors, as we talked about last week. But in the early period, the governors were, uh, spent most of their time trying to establish rule over the entire Iberian Peninsula. So um, uh, development was limited. We talked about uh, last week how um, uh, the Umayyad Amir that escapes from the uh, east, Abdurrahman I builds the mosque, and across he appropriates the Visigothic uh, castle into the Alcazar or the Qasr or the palace of the Umayyads. Uh, we talked about how the mosque was situated to uh, uh, complement the existing Roman street, main street that went across the access from the gate uh, across, that, that came across the river to the gate in the back. We talked about the two suburbs. And um, we talked about how the Muslims came and created a new bridge on the, uh, exist over the existing Roman bridge that existed over the, uh, the, the Guadalquivir. And our main discussion point last week was the arrival of the Umayyad Prince Abdurrahman I and his transformation of Cordoba into the seat of his emirate. <clears throat> he was a skilled politician and a military leader which aided his mission to bring the entire uh, peninsula, Iberian Peninsula, or now we can call it Al-Andalus, under his control. Part of his success should be attributed to the fact that he lived long. He conquered Cordoba in 756, and at, at the age of 25, and died at, in 788, meaning he ruled for 32 years. Abdurrahman's lengthy 32-year rule was spent largely in the consolidation of power and control over the Iberian Peninsula. Umayyad control uh, came at a price, um, and he was the first leader willing to pay that price. The result of his efforts was the establishment of a family dynasty of rulers from the Umayyad clan who had been chased into exile from their homeland in Syria and had now reemerged in a new land far in the Western Islamic world. The Umayyad dynasty of Spain would last for almost 300 years, between 756 and 1031 CE, and in last week's lecture, we looked closely at the history of the Great Mosque of Cordoba and how, as the population of Cordoba continued to grow, the power of the Umayyads and the, and the power of the Umayyads continued to prosper, how the mosque was renovated by various Umayyad rulers and various artistic features were added to represent their power and prestige. The Umayyad rulers of Cordoba continued to make the city prosper after Abdurrahman's death. When the Muslims first arrived, they were a large minority and probably were far outnumbered by a pre-existing Christian populace in most of the areas in which they ruled, 
including Cordoba and the other cities. However, the early Umayyad rulers prospered in the creation of an Arabo-Islamic uh, Arabo uh, culture, which would take over the urban environments with, which had existed previously. For many Christians living under these new Arab rulers, adopting the new Arabic culture would have been convenient for their daily routines in the city. Uh, the Christians living under Islamic rule came to be known as Mos Arabs, or Mos Arabs, the Latin derivative of the Arabic word Musta'rab, uh, or someone who is like an Arab. For other Christians, conversion to Islam became a fiscally convenient thing to do. Under Islamic rule, Jews and, Jews and Christians were allowed to follow their pre previous religious tenets and their, its rules, but in exchange for protection from the state, they had to pay a poll tax known as the jizya in Arabic sources. Uh, they were called also in Arabic sources as the ahl al or the people of protected status, because of their re new relationship with, the, with their new Muslim conquerors. This gave them certain rights under the law, but certainly not equal rights. As a result of the social debasement and second-class citizenry that came with being part of the Ahlad Dhimma, or protected people, many Christians just found it easier to convert. This was obviously not favorable to the church authorities. We know a little bit about the Christians living in Cordoba in the mid-9th century through the writings of Paul Alvarez, a Christian Mozarab and religious scholar who lived in Cordoba during this time. He was friends with a fellow theologian named Eulogius. And between 850 and 859, both of these figures were involved in a movement within the Mozarab community in which some Christians, it wasn't a mass movement, it was some Christians out of the total population of Cordoba who had been upset uh, with fellow Christians uh, apostatizing and leaving Christianity to become Muslim. So they decided to publicly denounce Islam in public spaces its prophet Muhammad, and also begin to proselytize um, other Christians and exp uh, publicly berate them for leaving their faith. The public nature of this movement caused an uproar, and those who joined the movement to publicly insult Islam and its tenets were put to death by the Umayyad rulers. During this period of nine years, between 850 and 859, almost 50 Christians were executed. As a result, in Christian historical sources, these men and women are remembered as the martyrs of Cordoba and the movement as the martyrs of Cordoba movement. What is interesting about this time period, 850 to 859, is that we have uh, certain narratives that Paul Alvarez wrote. He wrote um, several books uh, as polemics against Islam, and he also wrote uh, the life story of uh, Eulogius, who was um, a fellow co-religionist uh, living in Cordoba, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Paul Alvarez also commented on the cultural situation of Cordoba, and he lamented the loss of Latin Christian culture in the wake of popular Muslim culture, which had transcended Cordoban life. He wrote, quote, and this is a lengthy quote, but I thought that I would read the whole thing out. What trained person, I ask, can be found today among our laity who, with the knowledge of Holy Scripture, looks into Latin volumes or any other, uh, or any of the, uh, uh, the doctrines? Who is there on fire with evangelical love, with love like that of, of the prophets, like that of the apostles? Do not all the Christian youths, handsome in appearance, fluent of tongue, conspicuous in their dress and action, distinguished for their knowledge of Gentile lore, and by Gentile he meant Muslim lore, in this case, um, Highly regarded for their ability to speak Arabic, do they not all eagerly use the volumes of the Chaldeans, and by Chaldeans he was referring to the Arabs? Do they not read them with great interest, discuss them ardently, and collecting them with great trouble, make them known with every praise of their tongue, the while they are ignorant of the beauty of the church, and look with disgust upon the church's rivers of paradise as something vile? Alas, Christians do not know their own law, and Latins do not use their own tongue, so that in all the College of Christ, there will hardly be found one man in a thousand who can send the correct letters of a greeting to a brother. And the manifold crowd without number will be found who give out learnedly one sentence of Chaldean, or Arabic, rhetoric. So that from the more sophisticated song of those people, they embellish their final clauses metrically and in a more polished beauty with the bond of a single letter. 
according to the demands of that tongue which closes all phrases and clauses with rhyming vowels, and even, as is possible for them, the various expressions of containing the letters of the whole alphabet are reduced to one end or to a similar letter. The end part, he's actually quoting uh, the rules of uh, traditional Arabic poetry, the Qasida. Um, in a Qasida, in the medieval Islamic world, um, verses of a poem were set to a meter. So different poems uh, had to have a certain amount of syllables to create a balance between both uh, verses. And so uh, both verses were usually bicouplets. Um, they could have more. Um, in Spain, uh, a development happens where we have five uh, uh, verses in one verse. Um, but when you have a bicouplet, the last letter of the, of, of, of the poem, uh, let's say that it's an R in Arabic. So the whole poem, will, every word will end with an R and also metrically uh, match or metrically be balanced with the other uh, words at the end of the, uh, of the poem. So basically, that will be the rhyming word. So um, I can just uh, give you an example. Uh, satir, fatir, uh, hadir, uh, all end with a, 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 a R, and they all rhyme sort of like the hadir, the fatir, and the satir uh, would all be the way that an Arabic poem would rhyme. And so he, what, what Paul, what Paul Alvarez is saying is that Nobody is reading the Latin sources anymore. Nobody is reading Latin poetry. No one's reading Latin scholarship. And everybody has turned to sort of this new cultural wave that has come over Cordoba. So what the Umayyads did was that they were able to bring in um, this literary culture from the East and make it prevalent in Cordoban culture uh, to, both, to, to both Christians and Muslims and, Jew, and, and also Jews living in Cordoba. Uh, but in addition to the realm of literary culture, the maids of Spain also brought about revolutionary change in several other aspects of courtly <coughs> and popular culture in Cordoba and beyond. Several sources tell us about the legendary figure of Ziryab, who actually existed, but we don't know how much of his influence actually pay, played a role um, in the, um, uh, the arrival of Eastern culture into Spain, but a lot of the sources attribute this, this movement to him. Uh, Ziryab was a musician who was born in Iraq in the midst of the Abbasid dynasty, which was ruling at the time, and was forced to leave in exile because of his popularity uh, at the court of Baghdad. As a result of having to leave his homeland, he too, like Abdurrahman, chose to travel west and ended up in Spain. At the court of Abdurrahman II, who was the ruler of Al-Andalus between 822 and 852. So this is immediately preceding the Martyrs of Cordoba movement. Ziyab's arrival in Spain, since he was a renowned figure back east, has been likened by some historians, and um, I will quote what that historian has said, that when he arrived in, in Al-Andalus, it was similar to the arrival of the Beatles and John Lennon to the US for the very first time in 1964. I wasn't alive then, uh, so I don't fully comprehend the analogy, but I think some of you do, uh, hence the, the um, reaction. So I do now understand and I get the idea. And I hope many of you other uh, people do too. Uh, but everyone was very excited that Ziryab had, had arrived to Cordoba. And what he did was he glamoured the population of Cordoba. He was, um, he was basically embodied high culture, high Islamic culture of the time. And he taught the people their uh, knowledge of the styles of dress, hairstyles, uh, trimming beards, uh, food choices and popular cuisines, cooking methods, clothing and dress, and popular arts and crafts that were all popular in the Baghdad court of the Abbasids. And so a lot of this was um, received with great reception by the people of Cordoba, and Ziryab becomes a legendary figure as a result. But most of all, he brought his music. Some sources say he founded a music institute in Cordoba, and he was also apparently the master of the lute, and apparently added a fifth string noted as being red in color in the sources to the lute. So the lute uh, traditionally had four strings, um, and they say that when he arrived in Cordoba, he, he was a master at the lute. So his lute specifically had a fifth string that was red. And his modifications made Andalusian lute playing significantly more progressive than the traditional lute instruments back east 
and in North Africa. And he was very influential in the creation of an Andalusi style of music known as the Noba. Uh, the slide behind me um, is a miniature uh, from an Andalusi manuscript belonging to the 13th century known as the Hadith Riyad wa Bayad, or the story of Riyad and Bayad. Uh, this fable is actually a love story between Riyad, the son of a Damascene merchant, and Bayad, an Iraqi slave girl. Uh, their unlikely union uh, was was very, very much like a Romeo and Juliet story where they had to meet each other in secrecy. Um, and so this scene behind me is uh, Barad playing the oud, uh, for, not for his lady, I believe, but for a lady in, in, in one of the courts. But what you can imagine from this 13th century Andalusi manuscript, which is very rare because we don't have that many uh, illustrated manuscripts coming out of Spain in the, in the medieval period. Uh, this one has 14 illustrations inside there. And um, we know that it was probably produced in the 13th century in the Almohad period, and most likely due to the style of dress and the architecture, um, many scholars believe it was produced in Sevilla. But one can imagine similar musical audiences taking place in the Umayyad courts and those of the later Islamic rulers of Spain. And even today, I, um, as some of you mentioned, um, Andalusi music is, is, is well alive, and so we can see similar scenes like this even today. And this was a common, the lute player was a common motif in Islamic art and architecture throughout the Islamic world and specifically in Islamic Spain. Um, behind me is a 10th century ivory Umayyad pixis, uh, which is just a, a fancy word for a cylindrical container, uh, which probably had uh, um, senses in it or perfumes. Um, and they were made only for royal family members in the 10th century. So usually they bear the name of a princess, a prince. Um, behind me is uh, the pixis of Al Mughira. Al Mughira was the son, uh, the young child son of Abdurrahman III. Uh, so this was made towards the end of the 10th century. And along with uh, extreme arabesque foliage, uh, birds and all kinds of animals. You also see a lot of human figures uh, on these uh, carefully carved with inscriptions around the lid. Um, and so you see courtly attendants like the scene before me, cross-legged, seated, often with a wine cup in their hands and then the lute player in the center. And here's a close-up. And this is also um, a similar 10th century carving, which is actually from not a cylindrical box, but a uh, so cylindrical pixis, but from a cylindrical casket or box uh, from the Umayyad period uh, that shows the extent of the ivory carving and, and the art that was going on during the Umayyad period in Spain. Um, you can see that often they have, uh, it's st stylistically they'll have uh, affronted animals. Here are two uh, wolves or foxes, two peacocks, two falcons, and then two children playing in the center. Um, this de design would be on the front, but the design would be, uh, the plaque would be stuck onto a wooden box on four sides, and so the decoration would carry all the way around the top, and on the lid would also be uh, fully decorated in the same fashion. Here's a close-up of uh, you can just imagine the amount of work it took to carve this it, with precision. Notice the, the leaves. The leaves also have the veins uh, as details inside them. The, the fur on the wolf or the, the fox. And you can also tell the differences between both sides, which lets us know that they were doing it a little bit freehand. This is uh, Al Andalus. This is specific to Al Andalus. These these ivory. Uh, no, I mean, is oh. the first one the manuscript you said was the thirteenth. The pirates also. Like, no, so the manuscript is later. Um, it's still Al Andalus. That's why I brought this specific oh. one. Uh, the the pixies of Mugira is from the Umayyad court of Cordoba. Uh, so actually, Medina Zara. It was produced in Medina Zara. We know that it was produced there. Um, and so this is st still Spanish Al Andalusi from the tenth century. Yes. 
Um, I should have actually, so the pixies, oh, I should have brought the, the scale. I would say that they are about um, eight to 10 inches. Uh, so this would be eight inches in length and about uh, maybe six inches high or maybe five, five inches high. Um, and it could vary around that much a little bit. Yes, <laughs> I mean, again, the, because it's so small, the precision is actually much more. <clears throat> so the introduction to, of the lute to Spanish culture by Arabs was cherished and remembered by future courts. For example, in this miniature from Alfonso X of Castile's uh, famous Cantigas de Santa Maria, a book of songs and stories mostly eulogizing the Virgin Mary, an Arab figure can be seen playing a lute alongside a Christian figure, indicative of the acknowledgement of the contribution of the Arabs to this unique style of Andalusian music. Along with the formation of a unique Andalusian visual cultural scene and literary cultural scene, the urban environment of Cordoba was also changing. The city had grown past its original walls. So here were the original walls. So the city had grown past it. And several palace estates belonging to high-ranking members of the maid court began to spring up around, the, around Cordoba. These estates were surrounded by uh, rich farmland. And as a result, communities developed surrounding them. And they were known as munyas. Um, these, these palatial estates. And when these communities grew up around them, these became the suburban areas of Cordoba. So think of all of this as like South Lake and um, everywhere else north of Dallas where everybody's going. Um, and so we can remember from the last lecture that one of these first munyas or, or sort of garden palaces, was built by Abdurrahman I. Uh, if you remember, he built a palace outside of Cordoba called Rusafa in memory of a palace he had once lived in when he was in Syria at a young age. And there he grew all types of different exotic plants, uh, pomegranates, and there was a palm tree. Um, and so in the same way, these new, new Munya estates were also surrounded by gardens and all types of horticulture and agricultural development. Uh, if you remember from the last lecture, uh, with that map that we flipped around, Al-Andalus was in no way isolated from the rest of the Islamic world. As a result of this connected world, the Arabs of the 9th and 10th centuries brought about what a lot of historians call a green revolution around the world. And what this meant is that they brought crops and plants of all kinds to grow in foreign terrains that were, uh, where, where they were not naturally grown, across oceans and across territories, and they grew and cultivated these new crops and plants in new places. Plants were, which were introduced in, uh, into Spain via the Arabs include, uh, during the 9th and 10th century, during this green revolution of the 9th and 10th century, um, are eggplant, cotton, henna, rice. And someone had pointed out to me that there's so many words that um, are Spanish. Uh, but come from an Arabic origin, so the word for Spanish, uh, for rice in Spanish is um, arroz, and uh, in Arabic it's al oros. So um, the fact that the Arabs brought rice to Spain is indicative of the continuation of that Arabic root word in the Spanish. And you'll see that a lot. Um, and a lot of this actually happens much later in the 16th and 17th century, so, so you'll see that a lot where the reason that there is um, an, an English name for a fruit, often or not, is because it came from the New World to the Arab world. So um, the, they brought, um, so along with rice, they brought bananas, jasmine, lemon, saffron, sugarcane, and most importantly, which we'll talk about later, mulberry trees. Um, and later in the 11th century, they bought spinach, sorghum, and oranges. Now, the word for oranges is usually naranj in Arabic, but in the Arab world today, for some reason, they call oranges burtaqal. And burtaqal obviously comes from Portugal, so it's actually more indicative of where fruits were coming up, uh, coming from uh, in the early modern period. So a lot of things that we don't know is that like uh, Italian food, if tomatoes were grown in the, in the New World and then brought over, um, what was Italian food like before we discovered the New World without tomatoes? 
uh, what was um, food like without french fries uh, for us Americans um, because we didn't have potatoes, uh, pumpkins. So a lot of the cuisines that we see now in countries um, are very modern if you look at it historically. So it's, I think that's very interesting. Um, and during this time period, in the, especially in the 11th and 12th century, there are several medieval Arabic treatises on agriculture and farming which originate uh, from Spain as well. And as a result of this agriculture development, the advancement of hydraulic technology also arrived to Spain. Several archaeological sites around Spain still have remnants of irrigation systems built by the Arabs in Al-Andalus. The Arabs built cisterns and developed several methods to collect and utilize rainwater for agriculture and other purposes. Technologies such as the noria, or in Arabic, na'ura, uh, a wheel, which you can see behind me in the slide, uh, was a wheel used to bring water up from streaming rivers to transfer it to irrigation systems or channels or even aqueducts. And so this technology was brought to Spain. Um, this, again, is from the same manuscript that we saw earlier from the 13th century. Uh, this is where Riyadh meets the old woman who is sort of the, the lady who's helping him court Bayad. Um, but um, that's not important to our discussion today. What is important is the structure that they've created on the river. So she's sleeping on the river when he meets her. Um, and then this is the, the wheel uh, that would, br would bring water up and bring it back into uh, and channel it into either an irrigation ditch or an aqueduct. Several marias from the medieval period, from the 12th and 13th century, um, obviously not the wood, but the structures themselves, still exist, I believe, I don't know today after the situation in Syria, but up until before the war, uh, existed near Hama on the banks of the or Orontes River. Uh, the technology was not invented by the Arabs. Um, a lot of the hydraulic technology was not. Um, the Byzantines, uh, learning from the Romans, had already inherited a lot of uh, hydraulic technologies, but they were learned by the Arabs and they were perpetuated by the Arabs and the Arabs continued to use hydraulic technology uh, to, to, to foster this green revolution. And so, as a result, North Africa and Spain created sophisticated irrigation systems in order to grow any kind of crop coming from foreign lands. Uh, we need a lot of water to grow cotton, and so cotton was, was being uh, transported from, from Persia to the rest of the Islamic world, and therefore uh, grown their linen as well. And so as a result of this connected world, various peoples, ideas, art, architecture, technology, agric agricultural crops, and whatever else could travel from city to city across these itineraries made its way to Al Andalus. Now, while the Umayyads of Spain were establishing a court and cult culture in the 9th century, the following century brought about several political changes in the Islamic world. The Mediterranean political map behind me shows that by 909, the Islamic world of the Mediterranean had changed drastically. In 909, a, a dynasty of Shia Ismaili Muslims rose to power in what is present-day Tunisia. Right here, that was their capital here and here on the, on the coast. They were, uh, so th this Shia Ismaili dynasty known as the Fatimids um, ruled what is present day Tunisia and later gained control over parts of North Africa including Libya, Algeria, and Morocco. Um, they were known as the Fatimids as I said and Fatimids as we know would mean the descendants or the children of Fatima so their claim was that they were the direct descendants of Muhammad through his daughter Fatima and her husband Ali, who the Shias believe were the rightful heir to the prophet Muhammad after his death in 632. As a result to the Fatima's rise in pol political power, the political map of the Islamic world was now fragmented between three, three powerful kingdoms. The Abbasids, who we learned about earlier, that were ruling the central Islamic lands from Baghdad and their other capitals that they built around Baghdad, the Fatimids who eventually end up extending their kingdom to Cairo uh, at the end of the 10th century, but they start here in, in, in Ifriqiya or Tunisia, what is present day Tunisia, and then the, Umayyad Calif uh, the Umayyads of Cordoba. At this time, they're still an emirate. However, 
the shift in politi the political climate of the Islamic world, which occurred in 909, also occurred during the reign of Abdurrahman III. Because the Umayyads of Spain had two rival powers who did not acknowledge their legitimacy as the true rulers of Al-Andalus, they decided to also rise to the challenge that their adversaries had made for them. So in 929, Abdurrahman III also proclaimed himself a caliph. Up until this point, they were just emirs or princes ruling uh, Spain. But now, they said that, no, we are the caliph of the Islamic world. And this claim was a direct challenge to the Abbasids sitting in Baghdad in Iraq and the Fatimids who were in Africa. However, when the two rival caliphates um, uh, saw that the Umayyads had risen, uh, this created a climate of political competition in the Mediterranean. Being named caliph is not the same as being a ruler or a king in the Islamic world. Caliph is the English derivative of the word khalifa, meant the, which means the authority left behind by the prophet Muhammad. The caliph was in many ways supposed to be considered the legitimate heir to Muhammad, and the spiritual leader of all Muslims residing in the Islamic world. His name was read on the pulpit in Friday prayers, religious taxes were sent to him, and in many ways he was revered as God's representative on earth, especially in the medieval period. In order to create an authentic persona around this title, Abdurrahman III and his successors created new trends of visual culture in Al-Andalus, which were typical to, of the stature of an all-powerful ruling caliph. One of the first changes Abdurrahman III made was in his coinage. Public inscriptions in the medieval Islamic world, in a culture that did not use imagery um, in, in, in their public spheres of religion and politics, in, in, I mean, they did to some extent, but not to the extent that other cultures did. Um, so as a result, uh, inscriptions and writing became very important, and they were the means to, to reflect political ideologies of the ruling body. And coinage became the best way, because what is seen the most in, by people is money being handed around in the markets. So Abdurrahman III, uh, what he did was two, he took two steps. He began to mint a gold coin, and a gold coin hadn't really been minted, so a gold coin is what we would call a dinar. It hadn't been minted in Al-Andalus since 744 to 745, so that's nearly um, 80 years after um, Abdurrahman, a little bit more than 80 years, Abdurrahman III is minting gold coins at that time. And um, the second thing is part of the royal iconography or the royal insignia of a Muslim ruler, uh, there are several things, but one of them is that he has to establish a mint in his capital. So Abdurrahman III establishes a mint in Cordoba and starts minting gold coins. And the third thing that he does is that he includes an ins ins a new inscription with all his titles which helped him lay claim to the uh, position of caliph. So on the uh, obverse side, as we saw in the earlier coins, we have the shahada, which is the la ilaha illallah, wahdahu uh, la sharika lahu, uh, and then Rasulullah Muhammad. And so basically that is, there is no God but God. Uh, uh, solely it is him, and he has no partner. And uh, his prophet, or his messenger, is Muhammad. And so here's the name of Muhammad. That was on one side. On the uh, reverse side was the name of the caliph. And so what the caliph is choosing here is three specific words to describe himself. Al-Imam, so he's saying that he is the Imam, or the true leader of the Islamic world. And then a caliph will always choose a title. So Abdurrahman III is his name, but he chooses a title, an nasir li which means the victor or the helper for, for God's faith or God's religion. And then his name, Abdurrahman Amir al-Mu'mineen. So Amir al-Mu'mineen is actually what is very important. And Amir means, uh, prince or commander, and mu'minin is the word for faithful. So um, there's a distinction between Muslims and then uh, mu'minin is like the, uh, the faithful 
We can get to that theological difference at another time. But what he's claiming here is that he is the ruler of the entire Islamic world. Whether people legitimize him or not, he is the true caliph. They didn't, so. No, but not a battle, but right. like a competition in a way. Oh, you're talking about the other, the Abbasids and the fact, yes. So would these coins be known about in those other two empires? Very good. That's a great question. So um, what the Fatimids were able to do was they had control over the Western Islamic world. And so uh, they controlled the trade coming up from Timbuktu, so from West Africa. So because of that, they had a... Uh, not to say a monopoly, but a great stake in procuring gold from West Africa. And so as a result, they were able to, for the entirety of their reign, which lasts 250 years, were able to mint a, a, a pure gold coin. Um, and so um, the, the fact that this coin was gold, like after being silver for so long, was the fact that the Fatimids were minting gold coins and boasting about it. And so this was actually um, a reciprocation to that act. Um, and so yes, they, they did know because money travels, right? So Fatimid coins coming minted in West Africa are seen as far as Britain and, and, and even north above that because people would want Fatimid coinage because of its purity and therefore it was actually better to exchange your old money into Fatimid coin monies because of the purity of the gold and people knew this. And so um, the another competition would have been minting the most pure gold uh, possible. Uh, again, I know uh, a gentleman asked me, are we going to go through the inscription? So I brought this slide by purpose. Um, uh, I said last week that the inscriptions chosen were actually reflecting this new power. So if we remember, uh, the great mihrab of the great mosque of Cordoba was built by um, uh, Abdurrahman III's son, Al-Hakam II, who ruled between 961 and 976. And he builds the, the dome and the polylobed arches in the front of the mosque. And he also is choosing this language deliberately on the most important monument of the mosque. So here you see sort of Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of God, the most merciful and beneficial, beneficent. And then it's sort of the names of God. So um, let's see what it is. It's he is Allah al al Hayyo la ilaha illahua al malakul So these are basically part of the 99 names of Allah, which is uh, a passage from the Quran. And then up here, uh, again, he is repeating a lot of that. And then he's saying that God chose him. Who did God cho choose? The Imam Al Mustansir Billah, which was his title, the one that is helped by God. Uh, Al Hakam Amir al Mu'minin. So Hakam the, the uh, commander of the faithful. And he uses that again in the lower inscription as well. So what is happening here is that they're deliberately choosing inscriptions to echo or to represent this new founded power that they're trying to present to everybody and to create their own legitimacy through visual culture. Again with this, part of the competition of these three empires uh, and I said before that the establishment of a mint was a sign of royal um, uh, sovereignty in, within Islam, uh, between Islamic rulers. Uh, in the same way, uh, the establishment of a tiraz factory or a tiraz uh, workshop and the, cr the production of tiraz, and by tiraz what I mean, tiraz means embroidery in Persian, um, is these beautiful textiles uh, that basically bear the name of the caliph in the same way they have religious inscriptions at the beginning and they have prayers of goodwill for the caliph. So they have the same language using Amir al Mu'minin, uh, uh, the commander of the faithful, al Imam, and they have the name of the caliph also on there. And so this one actually belonged to Hisham II, who ruled Al Andalus between 976 and 1013. Um, it was found in actually discovered in 1853 because these textiles were highly valued by um, the Christian world after the fall of Al-Andalus, and so a lot of them became relic uh, sort of stored in reliquaries um, in, in northern. So this one was found in 1853 uh, in the church of Santa Maria del Rivero of, es of San Esteban, 
the Gormas in Soria, Spain. And um, it was wrapped over a reliquary. Um, the inscription says, in the name of God, the compassionate and merciful, the blessing of God, prosperity and long life for the Caliph, the Imam Abdullah, which was his name, Hisham, uh, favors of God uh, and, and, and uh, favors of God to him, uh, or no, sorry, the favorite of God and prince of the believers. And so I wanted to remind you that um, part of this green revolution that the Umayyads brought was also the arrival of mulberry trees in Spain. Um, so the silk trade actually uh, uh, becomes very important in, in Al-Andalus. Um, and up to this point, Persian uh, textiles were the most favored. Um, but um, the, from the 10th century onwards, the silk trade starts being developed. The Umayyads develop it in Almeria Al or Almeria in the south by the port. And Andalusia's textiles also become valuable and traded across the Mediterranean. So we'll have letters, hopefully one day we'll talk about Jewish merchants who um, went across the Mediterranean and we have inventories of what they traded across the Mediterranean and a lot of them would buy textiles from Spain and a, a lot of raw material would come from the east and then be reproduced in Spain like linen coming from Egypt. So the, this textiles created a whole trade and had monetary value and because of the value that textiles had, because if you think about it, if I'm traveling and I want to exchange money, I don't want to take 5,000 gold, if I had 5,000 gold coins at that time, I'd probably be super rich, but um, I wouldn't want to take that on my camel and risk it being stolen uh, in my travels, risk it being lost. So I would actually exchange my money into textiles and then go to the new market and sell the text because textiles were much lighter. And so as a result, textiles bear the same inscriptions on uh, many of the times that coins do. So they could identify where they were produced. Um, and so the Abbasids had them. This is an Abbasid textile um, uh, from the 9th century. And I don't know how clear you can see this, but it has, it's a striped linen called a tabby linen. So, and I promise you every week I will try to blow your minds. So tabby means how many people might have a tabby cat or seen a tabby cat? Okay, great, all right. And so um, tabby is like this, is actually this striped, comes from this striped material. And it actually, the, so the name of fabrics in the Islamic world in the medieval period actually come from the place that they're produced. And so this one, tabby linen, was actually produced in a quarter of Baghdad, a, a market called Atabia. And Atabia basically was a very renowned fabric and it basically gets sort of exported in the Mediterranean. And so uh, the word that we get for tabby cat and tabby linen comes from this type of material. And the Fatimids, as well, were renowned for their uh, creation of this tiraz, which, again, I will emphasize was a royal symbol and a royal insignia. And so you can see, again, the similar inscriptions run around the top to identify who made it, in whose court it was made, uh, where the factory was. It actually even has the name of the town where the factory is in many cases. And then you'll often see animals. This one has birds in it. Um, Many of them have bunnies, and for those of you who know me, I'm obsessed with bunnies in, in medieval art. So uh, these are some of my favorite things to study. Uh, this is a close-up of uh, the veil of Hisham. You can see it is made up of gold thread, linen, and, and silk. It's a blend. Close-up of the animals. Right? Oh, right there. That seems like either a mythical lion of some sort, and this is a bird. Now, competition between sovereigns and caliphates also expanded into urban environments. So by 929, Abdurrahman III, had, he had spent the beginning of his reign uh, trying to quash rebellions. And he was trying to create stability and peace in Al-Andalus. And he finally is able to achieve that. By 920, 929 CE, he has made treaties with the Christian North, with Byzantium, with leaders in North Africa, uh, who were immediately located near Al-Andalus across the Straits of Gibraltar. And so his next step is to also follow the royal tradition of the Islamic world 
to build a royal capital outside the main capital. So basically a royal city that is only intended for members of the royal family. So Abdurrahman begins construction of a royal city outside of Cordoba, uh, so it's about four miles west, called Medina al Zahra. Um, Medina al Zahra, um, so at this time, again, Cordoba is surrounded by a lot of munyas, and then they build a road from Cordoba to uh, Medina al Zahra, and apparently that road was actually lighted the entire way and, and paved. Um, and uh, uh, Medina al Zahra was actually not an extension to Cordoba, but an independent city altogether. It had a different city manager, which in the text we know is the Sahib al Medina. It had a different city chief of police, so the police are called the Shurta. Sahib means master, so the master of the police. The Sahib al Shurta was separate. It had a separate judiciary, um, and so complete separate systems. And as I said, ooh, it was built. Four miles west at the foothills of the Sierra Morena, or the Jabal al Urus mountain range, which runs through Al Andalus, it was a location in an area which previously uh, had previously existing Roman hydraulic systems, which were present in the mountain. And because of these previous existing systems, aqueducts and piping systems uh, that had been earlier, the, when the Umayyads arrived, they revamped these systems, which were, had been in decay. And they create uh, pipelines uh, and ways to bring the water from these old aqueducts through tunnels and bridges and underground passageways uh, to bring them to Medina Zara to create enough water for the city and to create a sewage system, plumbing, and irrigation systems to make the city viable and surround it with gardens and other agricultural um, endeavors. Uh, it was very much like a, a very large and very loyal, royal and very private Munya estate. Uh, water would travel via aqueducts from the mountains to the north side of the city. Um, and then the water would actually go into a chamber, which is about 1.5 meters cubed. And then from there, it would pass into a reservoir built from stone. And from that reservoir, it would be used to be channeled into different um, channels and piping and underground sewers so that it could go to the rest of the city. And I do believe that probably the royal palace had dips on, uh, on dibs on who would get the water first. Now, Medina Zara's topography was built to adjust the slope of the mountain. Um, what is interesting about Medina Zara, which is unfortunately apocryphal and probably not true, was that the, the legend is Abdurrahman built it for a concubine of his, or in the name of a concubine of his, that was a very pious concubine. And she had, had uh, in her lifetime, created an endowment uh, which was supposed to be used to free Muslim prisoners who had been imprisoned in the wars that Abdurrahman had fought uh, with the Christians in the north and the Franks. Um, she died early, suddenly, and left this whole bequeathment of money and a slave's money would go to their, to their master. So Abdurrahman was left with all this money and so he tried to find slaves to free, um, but he couldn't find anyone, so he decided to build a city in honor of his beloved concubine, whose name was Zahra. Um, that's a beautiful story. Unfortunately, it's not true. Um, yeah. We all admire a good love story, but um, this story was added only in one source um, afterwards, and probably echoing the idea that uh, um, uh, of a Persian story where uh, the king builds a, a palace for his princess or his beloved. But as a result of the uneven topography of the city, the construction itself adjusted to the slope. So the city was built on three different planes at three different elevations. So there was a lower level, a mid-level, and an upper level. The lower level, which, had, which has not been completely excavated, or not at all actually, uh, consisted of a city which neighbored the royal city, in which non-royal personnel lived. And then the mid-level, uh, at a little higher elevation, where the palace city actually begins. And as you went to the highest level, that level was reserved for the caliph and his personal entourage. In other words, seldom did a visitor of Medina Zahara ever make it to the middle level, and hardly anyone made it to the upper level of private housing.
And the city was built over, so Abdurrahman started in 932, and for the next 40 years, uh, during Abdurrahman III's reign and that of his successor al-Hakam, building projects continue in this magnificent uh, city. Uh, skilled artisans were called from all around the Muslim world and beyond, even from Baghdad and Constantinople, and often the names of skilled artisans and carvers uh, can be signed, uh, can be seen sort of signed, they did their signature into various capitals and artwork in the city. So uh, here in this capital, we can see the inscription Amal Fat al uh, Sir Abd. Uh, so uh, this is the work of Fat. So it was a, a, a prisoner. So Al Asir means a prisoner named Fat, uh, who was uh, his slave, probably the slave of the of the uh, of Abdurrahman the third. So this pillar, uh, this capital is a little ironic because um, of the legend story that it was built by Zahra, who was supposed to free the prisoners. But like, apparently, like prisoners must have been uh, part of the craftsmen. Uh, and Medina Zara uh, um, didn't have the, the same luxury or resources that we saw earlier in Abdurrahman, the first uh, construction of the Great Mosque of Cordoba. And what I mean by that is that there were no more existing Roman structures for Abdurrahman III to bring in pillars and capitals. And so all these capitals were actually stone that was uh, masoned and cut and quarried, quarried, masoned, and cut, and carved, and put in the city. And along with them were pillars. Um, and so um, it took a lot of stone, a lot of manpower, and a lot of resources to build this new city from scratch. The reports in history say that Abdurrahman III employed 1,500 mules a day, 400 belonging to him, and the rest he rented from people, uh, from private owners. Um, so he rented 1,100 mules in, ex in extension or in addition to his uh, 400 that, uh, per day to carry a stone back and forth to the construction site. Um, he, every day, every three days, 1,100 loads of plaster and lime were brought to the city uh, to use as mortar. Uh, 6,000 blocks of dressed stone were used. Um, and the city needed 4,300 columns, large and small, and he brought them in from all over the world. And they even give numbers that uh, there was 1,013 from Ifriqiya, so from North Africa, 140 were gifted by the Byzantine Emperor, 19 were gifted from the Kingdom of the Franks, and the rest from Rome, Tarragona, and white marble came from Almeria, streaked marble from Malaga, pink marble from Cabra, and blue and gray marble from, from Peña Tejeda. And the city had 15,000 wooden door panels, which were all plated with polished bronze. So you can just imagine the cost that it took to build this, this, this huge city. Um, and Abdurrahman III, towards the end of his reign, had actually become known as just a great builder. He was just interested in building projects and got rebuked by the religious class because he wasn't attending Friday prayers often because he was busy at his sites. Um, and, and so, um, uh, he, he actually made a lot of decisions in, in the historical text for uh, decisions for the construction and ornamentation of the city of Medina Zahra. From the excavations that have been done so far, and in combination to the narratives in the historical sources, we know that Medina Zahra consisted of several buildings. And so um, this would be the lower level. These would be gardens. And then we come up to the mid-level. This number 12 is a reception hall, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, these were the, uh, this was the area reserved for the army, these were the stables, and then the east side, so the west side and then the east side of the upper level was reserved for the caliph, so this was full of gardens, his private rooms, um, and then towards the outer wall of the city um, was uh, a mosque built um, specifically for the royal members and also for the residents that lived outside of Medina Zahra. Um, so the mid-level consisted of the reception house and it also had gardens um, and the upper level combined and the whole royal city had 400 uh, houses for, reserved for the caliph, his entourage and his courtiers and then there was room for the army to live in stables. Uh, in addition to the residences, storage houses for butter and oil also existed, gardens of, and, and various workshops, which is very important. So Medina Zara had all the royal insignias needed for, mis, for medieval Islamic sovereignty and kingship. Um, 
And what I mean by that is that he established a royal mint there, so coins were minted there. There was a Tiraz factory there, which was also something that a caliph needed to have. And the person who ran the factory was always a trusted official, a high level of state. So his housing, as we know, was actually not on the west side. He lived in the Upper East Side, so, um, if anyone can, which actually works here. Um, and my favorite fact, or uh, historical narrative, is that uh, Medina Zara at the lower levels also had a menagerie or a zoo uh, which was surrounded by a moat and um, it also had a large aviary which was covered with a net. Um, animals were a frequent uh, gift exchange between courts and North African allies especially would give exotic am animals to other sovereigns around the Mediterranean. And so we know in one gift exchange Abdurrahman III received 20 chargers, 23 camels, 10 Sudanese marmot sheep, two gazelles and eight ostriches. And at an, in another point in time, he was actually gifted lions. And before Medina Dara was built, the Alcazar in Cordoba had a little ravine in front of it with a bridge across it. And so the lions were actually kept in that ravine uh, in front of the palace uh, until they were brought to Medina Dara. This is an aerial view that I brought, um, starting from the east. So this would be um, the house of a royal um, a tenant named Jaffa, this would be the royal residences, this is the uh, entrance, uh, sorry, the, the reception hall, this is going down to the mid-level where the gardens are, and then these are uh, where the military would live, and this is one of the main gates of the city, and this is the mosque. And here is another view, and so um, where you can see the levels more clearly, um, this is the lower level, then the medium level, the reception hall, and then the patio where the troops would live, and then where the royal palace was. So there were different royal halls and rooms, and in one description of the royal palace, up the Darul Mulk, um, we know from sources that uh, there were beautiful gardens and halls, and one grand hall had gold and silver roofing, colored marble and a large pearl hung from the ceiling which had been gifted, gifted to Abdurrahman from the Byzantine Emperor Leo. Uh, mosaics, gems, gold, and ebony wood decorated the surroundings of the room. In the center was a large tank filled with mercury and the light's reflection on the mercury during the day uh, made the room fill with a, a variety of hues all over the walls. And then they say that Abdurrahman had a special trick that when people would come over, he would ask his servants to boil the mercury. And when he boiled the mercury, it would cause an effect, and I don't know this is scientifically true, and I don't dare to boil mercury, but it would create a lightning effect of some sort. And so people were just amazed by this trick that he had in this, in this room. And mercury pools were very famous in the medieval Islamic world very dangerous, I don't know why they did that, and why they didn't figure out that that was very dangerous, Sorry, question. Why is it Why is it outside the city walls? Yes. Right, um, I think it's outside the city walls because they wanted Medina Zahra at the different levels to be hierarchical, so they didn't want, everybody's allowed to come to the mosque because that's God's house of worship. So they, this was basically a place where commoners and royalty could mix, but they did not want commoners in here, to, to put it bluntly in classes. Uh, <laughs> kind of like an Upper East Side apartment in New York, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> um, there were several gates in the city, so you, you would enter the city and actually pass from gate to gate. So from the south, uh, you, would, you would go through the gate of arrival, and then you would go to the gate of the statue. The reason it was called, the, this is Baba Sura, the reason it was called the gate of the statue actually was because most sources say that there was a statue placed there, and the name of the city is Zahra, and the name for Venus is Zohra in Arabic. So um, uh, the Umayyads actually might have kept a statue of Venus at the gate, which was removed in the 12th century, which one of my students is working on. Um, and um, then there was the, 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 the gate of the city, the Babul Medina. And then coming from uh, the side of the mosque, there, there was one door, this Babul Aqba basically would take you to the mid-level. Um, so this is where the palace would actually begin. But the Babul Sudda was actually the monumental gate, which is the only gate that they've rebuilt today, uh, which was on the west side of the city near the mosque. Um, and I wanted to show you a quick video of the construction of the mosque because 
It is one of the first buildings uh, to be uh, complete that uh, a mosque built in 944 to 945. Um, it actually faces the Qibla correctly, uh, which makes us think that they did have their measurements correct. Um, including its courtyard, it could accommodate 1,500 people. And today we don't, the exterior is a bit imaginary, but we know that uh, this is roughly what it looked like through what we have found. Um, its orientation, as it says here, was correct towards Mecca. There was a tower uh, for the Adhan, uh, for the call to prayer to be given. And um, there was also a section cordoned off at the, the, the front, like we saw at the Great Mosque of Cordoba, for the royal family. Uh, and um, the courtyard had porticos on each side, typical of a mosque of the 10th century. This is where people would pray inside. The nays were uh, arranged vertically towards the Qibla wall or the mihrab, and then the front area was reserved for the caliph. Um, this is, um, and I'll just go through the slides real quick because I'm a little bit over time, um, but this is um, uh, one of the royal households that we see today. They call it the, the Palace of Jafar, who was a vizier of Abdurrahman. Um, and so you can see that in Medina Zara, because it was destroyed in 1010, they just found uh, fragments after fragments and trying to piece it together to see what these buildings would look like. So this is actually a lot of reconstruction work done uh, to show us what the inside, I mean, what the exterior of a house would look like in Medina Zahra. Um, this is the outside of the reception hall. Uh, the reception hall overlooked a pool. Um, and so this is the um, not so tempting pool of the 20th century, but in, uh, we have to remember all the pools and the ponds around Medina Zara were actually quite spectacular. The, the historians tell us that uh, all the ponds actually were filled with fish and uh, that supplied the food for a lot of the people in Medina Zara. And the fish's diet was about 12,000 loaves of bread daily as well as a number of black beans. So um, they were kind of healthy besides the carbs. Um, but, this building, uh, the, the reception hall, which is today called the Salon Rico, uh, the rich hall, um, which was Abdurrahman's royal courtroom at the beginning of the mid-level. So if people were lucky enough to come up that high, they, they would meet him here in this building. Um, it overlooked the pond, and a constant feature of Islamic architecture is for the building to reflect itself on the pond in the front. Um, Again, speaking of water structures, this is the Cordoba stag from the Caliph period. It was found among the ruins of Medina Zara, so we know that it belonged there. Um, it is actually 24 and a half inches tall, um, and we know that um, it was configured to run water through it and then water come out of its spout. And so it was probably a part of one of the fountains at Medina Zara. Um, this is another one, and you can sort of see the detail of metalwork that was done at the time. <coughs> And this is a computer recreation of the, the royal hall, of, of what the inside would look like. So we, again, you have the horseshoe arches with red and uh, white carved stone. But in each one of these panels, there are carved stucco ornamentations with full vegetal arabesque motifs and inscriptions. Um, and as you walk around the hall, you can imagine embassies coming here and meeting the caliph. And, what he was trying to do to create an image of sovereignty. And it is a building that has actually a true mihrab inside it as well. And this is a detail of the stucco panels in the Salon Rico, of the, the detail of ornamentation that would have been carved into it. We can think about that they had expert carvers, so think back to the royal workshops. Some of those ivories were actually produced in workshops that were located within the royal city of Medina Zara. And that's why they were commissioned specifically, as we learn from the inscriptions around them, uh, for royal family members and princes. Um, this is the slide that we be began with. This is the interior of the Salon Rico. And um, this is the painting that we started, the Orientalist painting that we started the first lecture with, um, of Abdurrahman III receiving John, the monk of Gorza, um, by Basheras. And now we can actually come to appreciate the detail um, in this painting. Um, the different objects, the incense burners, uh, the furniture, the, the arches, 
all echoing the architecture of the Salon Rico in Medina Zahra. Um, like I said earlier, and I'm taking you to the last part, um, bear with me two more minutes. Um, these, all we have left of Medina Zahra was destroyed in 1010 uh, as a result of a civil war, and it was under the ground until the 20th century, and then it was discovered by Spanish archaeologists, which I hope to talk about in the next lecture. Um, but we have bits and pieces and fragments of Medina Zahra all over the world, especially the pillars, which have gone all over the place because the site was revisited by Muslim rulers of Spain in the 12th and 13th century who took pieces of it to rebuild their own buildings um, uh, in other parts of Al-Andalus and North Africa. So these have traveled everywhere. Um, this is another detail of the ornamentation fragments and the pillars. And then we have one here with us here at the Meadows Museum. Um, as you guys know. And recently, I worked on the translation again to just see and revamp the translation. And this is what we'll end with today. Um, if you start the translation from the corner, what you see is that it is the word bism in the name of. And so as we go around, it's in the name of God, of Allah, Ar Rahim. So the name of God, the merciful. Um, and then you keep on going around and then a, a passage from the Quran begins. And that passage is, um, blessed is he. Uh, um, uh, and then it goes on to the other side. Blessed is he who, um, blessed is he who, uh, if he willed, he would make. So this is ja'ala, which means he would make. And this part is a little bit damaged. And you can actually see from the top, sorry that um, this part of the, the, pill, uh, the capital has been damaged. Um, so he would make uh, laka for you, khair. So he would make for you greatness or to bestow upon you his benevolence. And, and then as we come around, uh, um, we have the word blessings. And if you read it together with the other side of that face, it says blessings from God. And so the entire, and then the last side says, has the word gipta, which means uh, it, uh, a state of happiness or bliss. And then the last word is kamila, which is an adjective for bliss, so complete bliss. So the entire inscription um, reads, Bismillah rahman rahim tabarakallazi insha'a ja'ala laka khair Allah. And this is not part of the original passage of the Quran, but I believe that the artisan just stuck it in there. Um, baraka min Allah, gipta kamila. And so what that translates as is that in the name of Allah, the merciful, so it's actually using the bismillah in a shortened form because usually the entire bismillah comes with in the name of Allah, the merciful and uh, benevolent. But then it says, blessed is he, if he willed, could have made for you um, or bestowed upon you Allah's benevolence. So khair Allah. And then blessings from Allah, complete happiness. Now, why is this particular passage really important? And I will take one more minute. It's because the entire passage actually goes on to say, um, blessed is he who, if he willed, could have made for you, um, or bestowed upon you benevolence, and also made for you palaces and gardens that had rivers flowing under them. Um, and so that imagery takes us back to Medina Zahra and to uh, let us know that this pillar actually um, echoes the architecture that it was surrounding of palaces and heavy, uh, par paradise, of, of, of rivers, of water flowing, hydraulic structures, and this beautiful 10th century city that was created four miles out of Cordoba. So thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, yeah.